guys. Hope everything's going well. I know it's been a while. Uh, work gets in the way sometimes, but that's okay. Got to pay the bills somehow. Um, just wanted to, to say hi. Uh, wish everybody the best. And uh, this will be the start of kind of a, a new series-ish. Um, what we're going to do is the live streams that we've had in the past and the live streams that have to come. Uh, whenever I find a, a conversation that seems like it hits a good topic that somebody can learn something from, um, I'm going to go ahead and take some snippets out of that and put them together to keep them on a single topic and make a shorter video out of that. You guys know how live streams go. They can be, you know, hour, two hours, three hours long and they don't always stay on topic. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back through some of those that we've done in the past and pick out some of the, the good tidbits here and there that I think everybody can learn from. Uh, so do me a favor. If you enjoyed this video, let me know what you liked about it. Let me know what you didn't like about it. Let me know what you could do uh, to, to, do, to do different so that you guys enjoy it a little bit more. Um, so without further ado, let's talk about CO2. Here we go. You in the planted aquarium. Mm, I don't know if I like that too much. We'll see. CO2 in the planted aquarium. <laughs> Old school World War II flight head set. Uh, I'll have to see what I can undown. Maybe I can come up with something creative. Uh, but like I said, we're going to talk about some CO2 in the planted aquarium and uh, fish guy next as a presentation. Yep. I've given this one before. Um, I haven't updated it for a couple years. Um, so if there are any little bits and pieces of information in here that don't look quite right, uh, uh, let me know. And, and uh, if, if I don't catch it, uh, hopefully you point it out to me and I'll correct it. Uh, if not, um, hopefully I don't sound too silly. I try to stay on top of things. Uh, but anyway, yep, that's me. I'm Mike. Uh, this is a presentation about CO2 in the planted aquarium. Slide, please. Boom. Here's what we're going to talk about. Uh, for any of you guys that have been in the military, I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about it, and then I'll tell you what we talked about. Standard procedures. Uh, so overview, we're going to talk about why you'd want CO2 in a planted aquarium, what equipment is required to add CO2 to your planted aquarium, how you'd set it up, uh, just kind of go over the basics. We'll talk about tuning it a little bit to optimize your CO2 levels. Uh, and then we'll talk about extra odds and ends. We'll do questions throughout. Uh, there's only about 15, 20 people in here. So don't be shy to ask questions while we're going. We should be able to fit them in just fine. Uh, and then closing remarks where, like I said, <laughs> I'll tell you what I told you. So that's that. If you guys are ready, we'll keep going. The slide, please, about uh, how, why, why you'd want CO2 in your planet tank. What's up, Tony? Thanks for stopping by. Uh, I'm Mike. As you know, this is All Things Fish, and we're talking about CO2 and planet aquariums tonight. Slide. Uh, why do you want CO2 in your planet tank? It seems it can be uh, daunting and confusing at times, uh, but it once you grasp some simple concepts, uh, it makes sense uh, quite a bit. So uh, uh, why would you want CO2? CO2 injection boosts growth rates five to ten times compared to growth in low-tech aquarium and helps tremendously in growing carpets and colored plants, thin stems, stunted leaves, poor coloration, algae and plants are all common signs that CO2 levels are inadequate for optimal growth. Uh, that's a quote from Mr. Dennis Wong, uh, who is uh, from Singapore. I believe pretty popular name in the hobby as of the past few years. He did speak at the Aquatic Gardens Association event in Washington a couple years back. Um, anyone else lose it? Uh oh, are we here or are we back? Uh oh. Are we back? I see a couple of people say we're back. I refreshed um, and it looks like we're here. Let me know if you can, just real quick, let me know where I lost you guys. I see a couple guys said that, you, that uh, all right, we're back. Okay. Uh, so some benefits. All right, looks like good. Uh, benefits of CO2, uh, like Dennis Wong uh, mentioned five to 10 times the growth rate. So if you're trying to farm plants um, and make a couple bucks back here and there, CO2 is gonna grow things faster. It's also going to give you better color, 
more dense growth and obviously healthier growth in general. Um, some plants may require CO2 for growth. Keep in mind uh, that a lot of the plants that we keep uh, are actually uh, grown immersed or, or primarily out of the water for the majority of the year, except for the wet season. Um, so when they're exposed to the air, they're not completely submerged in the water. They have access to atmospheric CO2 levels, which are approximately 400 parts per million. Uh, that's pretty impressive and a drastic change compared to when you submerge them. Uh, in a, in a regular aquarium, most plants submerged uh, your everyday aquarium, assuming, you know, uh, no intervention. Usually it's about four to five parts per million, just quite low. Um, so keep in mind that a lot of the times we'll inject CO2 to supplement those plants that, that may require those higher CO2 levels because they're not really often found completely submerged. Um, again, growth and color. You can achieve, you know, faster growth rates, denser growth, and, and just an overall looking uh, better looking plant um, by adding some co2 to help things along now plants are 50 percent or better uh, carbon so it seems silly that people don't consider adding carbon to their tank in the form of co2 which is how plants naturally acquire carbon for growth uh, and then algae inhibition um, which can be you know that that's kind of you can look at that a couple different ways um, co2 uh, helps expedite plant growth, which expedites nutrient uptake and healthy plants outcompete uh, algae in nine times out of 10. So that's why we might put CO2 in our tank. Did I put together a PowerPoint? This is actually a presentation that I've given uh, for a couple different clubs. Uh, so I didn't put it together specifically for tonight's stream, uh, but I'll definitely use it this evening. Slide. Uh, so plant requirements. What do plants need for growth? Um, light, carbon in the form of CO2, and then nutrients, which carbon is, in a sense, uh, you can kind of consider a nutrient, but, but most of the time we consider it as a separate uh, individual requirement. So light, obviously light is going to drive your photosynthesis for growth. Uh, nutrients, um, you're going to need your micros, your macros, such as you know, iron, potassium magnesium, uh, phosphates, etc. And like Fish Guy Nick said, this is kind of uh, the triangle of plant growth. Uh, your light, your carbon, and your nutrients, CO2. Um, light, I often refer to as kind of um, like the gas pedal uh, for plant growth. How much light you, the more light you have, the faster you're going to try to grow your plants, carbon, uh, CO2 is kind of like the, the air, go through your air intake. Um, if you have like a turbo or supercharger, uh, that's shoving air into the engine or shoving CO2 into the plants. Um, then your nutrients are, are kind of like your fuel. Uh, and again, uh, this is a, a tank by my friend Kyle Dunn. Uh, this was kind of the early stages, but he does have CO2 on this. Um, as you can see, there's uh, quite a variety of plants in there. What's up, Scott? How you doing, man? Um, Dragon Layers here. Howdy, howdy. Deborah Lewis. Uh, I mentioned carbon, like liquid carbon. Uh, give me a minute. Uh, I actually touch on this later in the slideshow. Um, so just stand by on that one for just a moment. If you don't mind, I'll get there. I will get there, I promise. Uh, Tony Dinfer, do you need to add carbon to your tank for better plant growth? Um, you can have an awesome planet tank without CO2 injection. Uh, just understand that your plant selection may be limited. And additionally, uh, your plants will grow a little bit slower. Uh, so I'm gonna pause for just a moment and we're gonna say hi. Hi, <laughs> I was just backstage listening. Priscilla. <laughs> just continue, All right. hi everybody. So give Priscilla a chance to say hi. Um, I know you've been listening. I know you talked about it, talked to you about it before, uh, but we're talking about CO2 and planet tanks. Awesome. I love All planet tanks right. and CO2. So uh, we'll, we'll jump back over here uh, and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so growth and color with the addition of CO2. Um, so this is the same plant on the left and the right on the left is in a tank with similar lighting to the right. However, 
no CO2. You can see there's a, a little more space between the internodes, so spacing between leaves. Definitely not the uh, the intense uh, red coloration. And this is a mini type four. In case you're wondering, you can see, uh, obviously, the one on the right grows much faster. It's growing a, a lot more compact growth. Um, and then color as well. You can see a lot more of the pink red coloration as opposed to on the left. You kind of have uh, a subtle orangish coloration. Slide. Uh, algae inhibition, like I said, healthy plants will outcompete algae for available nutrients. Uh, and the addition of CO2 is going to help those plants grow faster. Therefore, they'll uptake those nutrients faster uh, before the algae uh, can attempt to utilize them. So uh, algae inhibition is definitely a, a factor and definitely a bonus. Now, there are some myths and misconceptions. Just adding CO2 to your tank won't kill off the algae. Um, and in some cases, uh, if you don't have healthy plants, feeding your tank a bunch of CO2, regardless, um, is, is just going to cause additional algae problems. Uh, and uh, this is a slide by Han Tran, who used to run Han's Aquatics. Um, now he runs, uh, uh, he still sells plants. He's just uh, more into the terrestrial green right now, like Monsteras uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Super good dude. Um, if you ever see Han Tran around, make sure you say hi to him. Nice guy. Slide, please. So let's talk about equipment that you might need um, to run CO2 in a planted tank. We'll talk about kind of the various types of setups, such as DIY, like a do-it-yourself mixture versus a pressurized setup. Um, the tank itself, you'll need a solenoid, a regulator. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, diffusion methods and how we can monitor uh, the CO2 that we put into our tank. Uh, so there's a couple options. Uh, I'm sure most of you are familiar um, with the, uh, the various options for DIY CO2, this could be called uh, either DIY CO2 or a CO2 generator. Uh, this is generally some sort of container that you use like a citric acid mixture in, uh, or back in the day, long, long time ago, uh, we used simply yeast and sugar, uh, and that basically fermented more or less and released CO2, uh, which slowly trickled into our tank. Generally speaking, uh, a DIY type setup, while we have, you know, refined the mixtures using citric acid and various uh, pieces of somewhat simple equipment, uh, DIY will be, you know, cheaper short term, uh, but it can be, you know, quite a bit of work. And if you don't stay on top of it, it can be pretty inconsistent. Um, and when it comes to CO2, inconsistent and fluctuating CO2 levels can lead to various algae problems. Now, a pressurized setup, uh, such as you'd see with, you know, your standard CO2 cylinder, you have a regulator, which uh, adjusts the high pressure that's in that CO2 cylinder down to a low working pressure. Um, you'll have a solenoid, which is more or less an on-off valve that's electrically controlled uh, to control when you're adding CO2 into that tank. Um, this obviously is a set it and forget it type setup that you usually uh, don't have to tweak much. Once you get it dialed in, it's going to give you that consistency uh, to help you avoid algae and maximize your growth. Um, and then cost versus effect. It, it depends on your goals. Um, it's easy to spend a lot of money on a pressurized CO2 setup. However, um, like myself, I bought my CO2 setup that I use on my 125 planted display that you guys have seen my videos um, used in 2005. I think I paid a hundred bucks for it. And because of that extra growth, you know, like Dennis Wong said, the five to 10 times increased growth rate, um, I'm able to, to grow plants quite quickly and sell them at swap meets, sell them online and ship them out, et cetera. And, and that pays for itself many, many times over. <laughs> Talked about DIY. Uh, Geek Boy said he spilled a two liter of yeasty alcohol all over the carpet. It, it does smell. It gets bad. Uh, citric acid is a little bit better. Uh, when I first got into CO2, I ran three two liter bottles on a 29 gallon tank and, and changed them out. Uh, I changed one out a week. So I rotated them to try to keep my CO2 levels fairly consistent. <laughs> and it was uh, a little bit of work. <laughs> uh, so what do you need 
Um, so for a pressurized setup, what you'll need is a cylinder. Now, personally, myself, I think a 10 pound cylinder is a great compromise between, you know, size and how much space it takes up. Uh, what size tank do you need? Uh, it kind of depends on how often you want to refill it and how much space you have. Now, I have a lot of space under my 20, 125. A 10 pound tank fits under there just fine. You may have a small nano aquarium. You may only have like a 10 gallon tank. Uh, so that CO2, you know, 10 pounds on a 10 gallon tank would probably last you a year or better. Uh, I know on my 125, I run, you know, a fairly high level of CO2. 10 pounds will last me about four months. So that kind of gives you an idea uh, of what size tank you may need. There's a lot of options out there. Some people use, you can use an old fire extinguisher. Some people use, you know, a dedicated aluminum tank that you may find, uh, like for homebrew stuff uh, or beverages. Um, and, you know, aluminum versus steel as far as the cylinder itself. I have an aluminum tank because it looks nice. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, I mean, aluminum and steel, they both work just fine. Um, and a lot of places that you can get it filled with CO2 include like beverage companies, uh, welding shops or gas shops. I get mine filled at a, a fire extinguisher uh, servicing company. Uh, and Priscilla's got that looks like probably a five pound tank there. Uh, so uh, uh, I personally, I, I own my tank. So I bought a tank that I own. It's aluminum. It's shiny. It looks good. Uh, I've got some different stickers on it. So I have my tank filled. Most shops will offer you, give you the option to simply exchange it where you take in your empty cylinder. They give you a completely different cylinder that's already full, and then you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, by owning a tank and just having it filled, you do have to worry about a hydro test every five years, um, and that costs about 30 bucks. So factor that into, you know, kind of the operating cost, but 35 bucks long term every five years not really a big deal <clears throat> a solenoid so let's talk about a, a solenoid and i should have one handy i can actually i could run downstairs and grab one um or i can just show you guys a picture so a solenoid is a small uh like i said an electronic valve that either opens or close uh and it's usually attached it's, it'll be attached to the regulator most people run it uh, associated with a timer with their lights um, and on that timer you'll set the solenoid to open either when your lights come on or slightly before your lights come on to turn on the gas so that's to allow the co2 uh, to go to your tank at night you shut that off when the lights are on plants are executing photosynthesis so they're uptaking that co2 uh, and they end up pulling the carbon off of it and releasing O2 out into the atmosphere or into your tanks, water column. Um, at night, they kind of do the, the reverse uh, where they're releasing CO2 and absorbing a little bit of oxygen, not a ton. So at night, most people will use that solenoid on a timer to shut the CO2 off. Um, is it hurting the tank running it? Not particularly, but there's not really a need, so save it. Uh, and uh, why should I run a solenoid? Some people ask why, sh why should I run a solenoid? Some people use a solenoid to control pH. Uh, the more CO2 you inject into your tank, the lower your pH will fall as a result of the carbonic acid um, that results from that CO2 kind of mixing in with your water. Um, so a solenoid, will, a solenoid attached to a pH controller, which is more or less just a probe in your tank uh, that constantly monitors the pH. Uh, a, so the solenoid attached to the controller will either turn the valve on or off, depending on where you want that uh, pH level to be at. And we'll hit that. We'll touch on that and the importance of it a little bit later in the presentation. You'll need a regular. Now I was talking about a solenoid. You can see uh, the small silver uh, cube in the center of this setup. Uh, the solenoid itself is just the black box under that. The regulator, as you can see in this image, this looks like, you know, a Milwaukee M8957 type setup, which is pretty, you know, it's been around for a while. It works. It's budget friendly. The left side, you'll see two gauges. Uh, the far left is your tank pressure. The right gauge will be your working pressure. Um, and generally speaking, for most CO2 applications, uh, the tank itself is normally around 1,000 PSI, which is quite high pressure. That regulator is going to safely reduce that pressure. Uh, down into the 30 to 40 PSI range. 
um, which works well for most diffusers. Um, and then on the right, uh, you'll see a clear cylinder with a, a brass needle valve on the bottom. That's to fine tune how much CO2 is going into your tank. Uh, the airline will run out the top uh, to your reactor or diffuser, uh, whatever method you're using. And then usually this uh, the cylinder is just filled with water, and that uh, it's called a referred to as a bubble counter, where the CO2 bubbles will actually flow through that, so you're able to count them to roughly gauge the amount of CO2 that's going into your tank. Uh, it's not a precise amount because obviously, you know, bubble size can vary, uh, etc. But it kind of gives you a visual representation, so you can monitor it a little bit better. Uh, so let's talk about you know. We had the tank that stores the CO2, the regulator uh, reduces the pressure down to something usable, the solenoid turns the CO2 on or off, uh, the bubble counter we use for a visual reference as to how much CO2 we're adding to our tank, uh, and then you have to diffuse it into the tank somehow, which uh, just means to dissolve that CO2 into the water column so that your plants can uptake it and use it during photosynthesis, uh, so a diffuser uh, so a diffuser is generally a small glass pipe with like a ceramic disc and you use that CO2 at about 30 to 40 PSI or a little bit less even sometimes uh, and it'll force its way through that ceramic disc and release micro bubbles directly into the water column uh, and those will float around the tank and slowly dissolve, uh, you know, allowing your plants to, to utilize that CO2. An atomizer uh, is another method. It, it's quite similar to a diffuser. There are a whole lot of differences. Again, it's going to create a very fine mist. Um, and then a reactor is, is my preference on, on most tanks over about 40 gallons. Diffusers work great for smaller tanks. A uh, reactor is going to be generally an external device um, outside of your tank, uh, usually plumbed in line with like a canister filter or a sump return line. Um, and that will actually, you'll inject the CO2 into the reactor. Uh, you will create, you know, some turbulence in that reactor. The CO2 bubbles will eventually dissolve in the reactor before uh, that water goes to your tank. And this allows for 100% dissolution and, and far higher uh, CO2 levels in the tank than most diffusers will offer. Um, so if you're pushing, you know, a lot of light or you want to really run a little more intense CO2 levels, reactor is definitely the best bet. However, it does take up a little bit of space. So if you're running a smaller tank, uh, a diffuse, an in-tank diffuser or an atomizer will work just fine. Now, there are other methods that some people may have seen, like a bell or an upside, like a glass bell that sits upside down in the tank. Um, or like a, some people either they keep using like a plastic bottle. They'll tip it upside down. I know there's a video that was kind of popular of a small shop out in California. Um, and what they'll do is they'll fill this CO2 bell up in the morning and let the CO2 slowly passively diffuse into the water column. Um, this isn't particularly efficient uh, and it's inconsistent. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into how fast or slow that CO2 in the bell dissolves into the water column. So it's not a method that I recommend myself. Um, it's also not a method that you can control if you have to go out of town. So like I said, that does lead to fluctuating CO2 levels and inconsistencies um, in, in CO2 diffusion. So it's not a, a method that I normally recommend. Uh, you'll also see uh, back in the day, you used to see CO2 ladders, which is basically just a piece of acrylic uh, that would zigzag back and forth. The bubble would enter at the bottom. And as that bubble slowly zigzag its way to the top, it would it dissolve into the water column. Um, Gonna skim. I see a couple comments and, and questions popping up. I'm gonna sim through them. I'm trying to move fairly quickly. So if I'm, I'm moving too quick or if I miss something, uh, say something, holler or do something to get my attention. Grantel asked, "What's your take on CO2 bell? So it has longer contact in water. That's what I just touched on. Um, I don't personally recommend it." Um, like I said, uh, there's a lot of factors, temperature, you know, barometric pressure that, that come into play as to how fast uh, that'll dissolve into your tank. Um, so I personally don't recommend it. Is it a method that people have used? Yes, um, but it doesn't uh, diffuse or, or dissolve CO2 into your tank particularly quick. Geek voice it. That's how you know uh, you're fairly old school is if you have a ladder diffuser, because I, I don't even know if they sell those anymore. Priscilla, do you know? 
Have you seen one at all? No, I have not. Sorry, I muted myself so you, the bubble sound doesn't distract. No, that's fine. I'm just cruising along right now. If you have anything to say, don't be afraid to chime in. No, just listen to me. <laughs> uh, Geek Boy said he bought his first pressurized setup from your shop 15 years ago. That's about how long I've been into it, too. Well, the shop's been around for 36 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I did... Initially in 2004-ish, uh, I played the DIY game with the yeast and sugar. I noticed that there was, you know, an improvement in my growth rate um, and, and decided to make the jump to a pressurized setup. And it's well worth the money, in my opinion. Um, if you want to just try CO2 and kind of, you know, familiarize yourself with it, DIY CO2 can be super cheap to set up on a two liter bottle or two. And, and if you look up one of the various citric acid formulas, or you could still use yeast and sugar. It's just not a particularly efficient method. Um, it, it's a good way to mess around with it and, and kind of get your feet wet. You should make a video on that. How to, how to DIY. do see, DIY. I could, I haven't set up DIY myself in a long time, so it'd probably be a decent little refresher. Uh, Does anyone use CO2 on Wallstead tanks? Um, so the idea of a Wallstead tank um, is as little, you know, outside input as possible. So I would say that if you are injecting CO2 into a Wallstead type tank, then it's no longer a, you know, roughly following, uh, you know, her experiment as she outlined it in her book um, i know wallstead method is kind of a a buzzword um in in the community a little bit uh, it's not a method that i personally recommend um that being said like i said if you are you know injecting co2 into what was a wallstead method tank uh, i no longer see it as wallstead myself Just my two cents. Fish can So since CO2 becomes carbonic acid when it interacts with water, what's the limitation with just adding carbonic acid into a tank? Um, on that note, I would say, is it possible? Yes, uh, you'd have inconsistencies. You might be able to, to go that route. Um, I think it would be a little more expensive um, if you had like a, an auto doser um, or like a peristaltic pump type setup where, you know, it was constantly pumping it into the tank at a specified rate. Uh, but pressurized setups are, you know, it's kind of been the, the standard method for so long that I don't really see a reason to, to try to mess with anything else. Uh, and while I have somewhat of a chemistry background, uh, I am not a chemist by any means. Um, so I'm sure if it was a more viable method, somebody out there would do it, but nobody's doing it. And, and there must be good reasons. Uh, as said, I'm just wondering what it would do for the plants. I guess the obvious answer is more growth. Uh, yeah, so more growth, faster nutrient uptake, uh, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, despite, you know, it being like a Wallstead style tank, um, it's CO2 will still have the same effect regardless. Uh, like Bruno said, kind of echoing uh, fluctuations and inconsistencies. Uh, so we talked about diffusion methods, how to get it into your tank. Uh, let's talk about a couple ways uh, that we monitor uh, how much CO2 is in our tank. You know, a drop checker uh, is generally, as you can see in the picture, a small glass ball uh, that sits in your tank. It has usually a 4-DKH solution mixed into it, uh, and that solution will change color. You know, it's a pH reagent, more or less, so the solution changes color based on roughly how much CO2 um, is dissolved in the water. Now a drop checker is a cheap tool and it's an easy visual tool, but it's not particularly accurate. There are variables to it um, and it is a little bit of a lag instrument. So if you inject CO2 into your tank, you know, your lights come on at eight o'clock, so your CO2 comes on, you know, seven o'clock, an hour early, whatever. Um, that drop checker may not indicate your actual CO2 level um, for several hours uh, throughout the day. 
Um, so drop checker is an option, like I said, for, you know, the 10 bucks that most of them cost, unless you're looking at like a GLA makes some super fancy, weird, awesome look at drop checkers um, that can run you a lot of money. But for 10 bucks, it's an easy visual indicator. So you walk by the tank, you eyeball it. So, yep, uh, it's it's roughly, you know, my target value, which is, you know, we'll get to it later. But 30 ppm is about, uh, you know, kind of the, the accepted target uh, in most planet tanks. You can also monitor by pH, like I said, a pH uh, controller or even just a pH monitor using a pH probe. Uh, as far as visual notes, um, you know, there are, you know, more key things that I could go into detail about. Uh, the point of this presentation is just to give you kind of a brief overview. Um, there are visual notes that you can see certain plants like Ludwigia vertical or Ludwigia inclinata, uh, the Pantanal variety, which you can see in the top of the background image, it's that red plant that kind of looks like a, a mum, I guess. Um, the plants will actually, the, the leaves of Pantanal will droop down uh, with low CO2 levels and then they'll open back up uh, when they hit, you know, kind of more desirable CO2 levels. So a lot of people can use Pantanal as like an indicator plant. Uh, there's some other visual notes that you can see if your fish are gasping. Uh, that's not always a sign that there's too much CO2. There could be uh, too little O2. Um, and a lot of times people, you know, think that those are directly related, but an increase in CO2 doesn't necessarily mean a decrease in O2. Uh, so don't get stuck on that. Uh, Myrtle asks, uh, Crown to asked if I can make the pictures bigger. Yep, I can make them a little bit bigger. I'll hide my ugly mug. Um, so I've never like used one of those drop checkers. Um, do you, how often do you have to, like, change the liquid in it? Um, I would say once a month. Uh, I don't use one anymore. You know, like I said, it's, it's, I just, you know, with, with experience, with time comes experience, with experience comes the ability to just kind of look at your tank and, and have a better idea of what's going on. Um, so I don't personally run one. I would probably change it, uh, roughly once a month. Uh, sand drop checkers can be difficult to use if you black out the back of your tank. Yep. Um, I agree with that. Thanks, John Oliver for the shout out. <laughs> Angus asked how much CO2 he needs to calm his flower horn down. Uh, I don't know if, if calming a flower horn down is a thing. That's the way they're bred, so good luck. <laughs> um, Ames. What's up, Ames? Thanks for stopping by. Uh, it's a, but I can't stay awake. Love y'all. All right, Ames, we'll see you in the replay. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, and I'll drop some useful links and stuff uh, in the video description as well for you to check out. Geek Boy said he's falling asleep in class. If I'm that boring, we can, we can try to mix it up. Uh, slide. Uh, so let's talk about how we set up CO2 in a planted aquarium. Uh, this used to be an old, this was a, what is it, 27 gallon bow front um, that my buddy set up. And he had some T5 HO lights on it, a little five pound pressurized setup. Uh, and as you can see, he's got quite a variety of plants tucked into this little tank. Looking pretty good. Uh, so we, we talked about the equipment we need. We talked about how we are going to get the CO2 from the cylinder or from your DIY uh, container or your generator. Uh, it, we talked about uh, the diffusion methods, whether you use a reactor uh, or a diffuser, inline atomizer, etc. cetera. Um, but how much CO2 are we trying to get into the tank? Um, now, generally speaking, the, the you know, accepted range uh, for a target uh, CO2 level is approximately 25 to 30 parts per million. And this can be hard to, to dial in. Like I said, drop checkers kind of get you close, um, but they can be, like I said, they are a lag instrument. They're not super precise. Uh, there is this met the the chart here um, where you uh, test your pH, you compare it to your dKH, um, and somewhere in between, you know, you cross, you find out where those meet up, uh, and, and that's roughly your your CO two level in your water column. Um, well, it's not necessarily wrong; it's a little bit of an older method, um, and it is a little bit outdated uh, anymore. Most people now. Uh, use like a pH drop method of, of measuring the CO2 levels in your tank. And this, this does vary uh, based on your actual water hardness or your DKH. Um, but generally speaking, from the time your CO2 comes on to midday, 
you want your pH to drop approximately one point. Uh, so a 1.0 drop in pH throughout the day it is roughly a pretty good indicator that you're hitting about 30 parts per million. Some people push that a little bit more and they'll go to 1.2. I would say, you know, obviously start small, work your way up. Uh, additional considerations, uh, you know, do I need CO2? Um, well, even if you're running, you know, obviously a, a higher light tank generally you know, pushes a little bit more uh, of a necessity, um, but you're, you're more likely to, to, to want CO2 on a higher light tank. That being said, like I said earlier, when you have uh, an aquarium, so those plants that are used to being immersed out in the wild, so out of the water, they have access to atmospheric CO2 levels. Again, approximately 400 parts per million. You put them underwater, most aquariums uh, sit between, you know, four and five parts per million. That's a drastic decrease. They need that CO2. Uh, it's part of the photosynthesis process. Um, so to speed things up, even in a low light tank, uh, to get healthier plants, better growth, you're going to eject CO2. Uh, nutrients. So more CO2, like I said, so light's kind of the gas pedal. CO2 is the, the air. Nutrients are the fuel. So the more light you push, you know, those plants are going to want to uptake more nutrients. So you add CO2 to that. So you have your light, you have your CO2, nutrients uh, then become your limiting factor. And actually, it's a common misconception that, uh, you know, algae is often caused by an excess of nutrients. Um, in a planted tank, I've actually, you know, generally found the opposite, that a lot of algae rears its head when you have a nutrient deficiency often with phosphates. Um, uh, there are, you know, some other specific nutrients that some people can have seen algae uh, grow as a pop up of a deficiency as opposed to an excess. So if you are running a lot of light, you add your CO2. Uh, now nutrients can be your limb fat and you may see some algae growth. Uh, John said he's learning a lot. Appreciate you stopping by. Thanks for the kind words. An old Navy dive table. Yep, it's pretty close. Tony Danford asked, when you say, so we'll, uh, we'll drop back uh, a slide here. He asked about a pH drop. So your pH by one point, you mean if you start with an 8.0 pH, it will drop to a 7.0 pH. That's generally uh, your goal. So you want to, by, you know, the middle of your photo period, uh, so once your plants have been executing photosynthesis, your lights are on, your CO2 is running, you want to see a drop of approximately 1.0. So 8.0 to 7.0 uh, is correct. So as opposed to, so not a 0.1 pH drop, but a 1.0. Uh, and then we can talk about, so we talked about light. Um, and here we can kind of see a chart here um, where there's a, it's not necessarily such a, a linear curve uh, as opposed to, kind of parabolic, I suppose. Um, but you can see the exponential increase in plant growth uh, as a result of, you know, CO2 injection, uh, as well as running higher light. Just a quick graphic for you nerdy visual types. Um, we talked about nutrients. Um, so to avoid a, you know, a nutrient deficiency or a nutrient imbalance, I personally, um, I use the estimated index uh, to dose dry salts. Um, now, I use dry salts uh, for various reasons. One being it's extremely cheap. I can run my 125 gallon planted display tank with CO2 uh, using dry ferts for about a year and a half for about $20. Um, so what a dry ferts are is you'll mix uh, several dry salts uh, to, to achieve a desired nutrient level in your aquarium. So these include nitrates, phosphates, sulfates, uh, and then your micros, like your trace elements, that includes, you know, magnesium, molybdenum, boron, iron, stuff like that. Um, another option as a, instead of dosing dry salts um, is to dose liquid fertilizers. Um, so your liquid fertilizers uh, are stuff like, you know, CCAM has their flourish line, uh, which is super common you know, most stores sell it. I don't personally recommend it because the Flourish line is actually quite overpriced and very diluted and an incomplete fertilizer. 
Um, something that I usually suggest is Thrive by Nalak G. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful fertilizer. Um, it's based on roughly the, the nutrient content that you aim to achieve using an estimative index type dosing regime. Um, it's super affordable. Colin's an awesome guy. It's probably one of, of two or three uh, fertilizers that I would call complete all-in-ones, uh, meaning you dose, dope, you, you dose that one bottle and, and you're good to go. There are some other fertilizers. Tropica is not too bad. Um, again, I think it's a little overpriced. ADA has a liquid line. Uh, again, overpriced, uh, but that's kind of the name of the game when you're buying ADA stuff. Um, skim some questions real quick. Um, Tony asks, so this would be a plant only tank because that would be rough on fish for the pH to fluctuate that much. Actually, no. Um, so even in uh, you know in the wild, we see these same CO two fluctuations in you know natural bodies of water. So you know. People tend to overhype pH a, a bit much, in my opinion. pH a, and a 1.0 pH swing really isn't that big of a deal. Um, I, if, if you lose fish while injecting CO2, generally speaking, it's not because of a swing in pH. Um, so all my planted tanks uh, have fish in them, and, and I stock them quite heavily with fish. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, the, the tanks you don't see a ton of fish in, uh, often you'll see like the IAPLCs, so the International Aquatic Plant Landscape Con or Layout Contest. Um, generally speaking, those tanks aren't really running for more than four to six months, so they usually only put a few fish in there. Ground tail, definitely learning a lot. But some of these, if you can do snippets for easier knowledge, etc. Also, what's runtime CO two or as same as the life cycle? Um, yeah, I, I can definitely like I said this this stream is to get your interest and kind of get your brain thinking a little bit about CO2, not so much to go into the specifics. I will make individual videos to, to kind of go into the specifics like uh, Priscilla and I talked about. Um, I'll make a video dedicated to how you would do a DIY setup. And I'll show you, I'll walk you through, you know, the equipment that you need and the actual mixture and how that process goes. Same with a pressurized setup. Um, so I'll break that down for you. As far as runtime for CO2, uh, most people run theirs uh, on the same timer as their lights. So the lights come on, CO2 comes on, lights go up, CO2 goes up. Um, another option to optimize your CO2 levels is to turn your CO2 on about an hour before your lights come on. Now, what this does is allows that CO2 to saturate the water column, allowing your plants instant access to that target of about 25 to 30 parts per million uh, as soon as the lights go on when they start photosynthesis. <laughs> Uh, Bob Nolers asked, do you plant crypts in soil or attach it to wood rocks? Definitely plant it in the substrate. George asked, where's a good place to buy dry fertilizers for a planted aquarium? And, you know, Colin is kind of my go-to. I've been buying stuff from Colin for quite some time. So I'll get you the link to go over there. And if you're interested, um, there you go. Drop the link for Colin. Um, and I can show you the specific packages that I use. Um, I actually, so he offers a lot of different options. I use the estimated index uh, NPK CSM plus B pack, which I'll drop in this link. And for about 20 bucks, you know, figure shipping. I can run a 125 gallon tank uh, for quite some time. That's literally the link I just dropped is the picture that's on the screen now. Uh, George said he runs a CO2 24 seven on his 120. Yep, that's just fine. A lot of people do, um, you know, no problem at all. I mean, there's not really a, a particular downside to it. Like I said, plants just don't use it at night. So it's not really necessary. Some people are, don't want uh, that pH swing, which even if you leave the CO2 on the whole time, you will see a little pH swing uh, just because the plants aren't uptaking it. So there will be a little more in the water column. Uh, so Tony mentioned it's interesting because a lot of people on the internet and YouTube talk about just having a consistency in your pH to keep fish in a healthy environment. Uh, yes, and I am a proponent of consistency regardless of what you're talking about. Uh, 
However, when you're just looking at a 1.0 swing throughout the day as a rate result of CO2, um, you're just fine. When I think of inconsistency in, in pH levels, uh, what I'm thinking is if people are using like pH up, pH down, uh, if they're adding a bunch of tannins or big chemicals in their water and then doing a large water change after a while. So those those potential big swings or inconsistent swings is as a result of adding chemicals to your tank. Um, look forward to end ups. Yep, you bet. Happy to help. Uh, again, more chit chat, uh, kind of about what we've been talking about. So if you, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. Uh, we'll keep rolling through here. Uh, so let's talk about liquid CO2 or liquid carbon. And I think Deborah, when we first started talking, asked a question about liquid carbon. Um, almost there. Uh, so Deborah Lewis said, you mentioned carbon, like liquid carbon. Um, so I will mainly talk about Flourish XL because this is the one that you mostly see on the market. And the majority of the liquid CO2 or the, the products that are, you know, mismarketed or misunderstood as liquid CO2 or liquid carbon uh, are generally a glutaraldehyde solution. This includes Flourish XL. This includes Aquarium Co-op's Easy Carbon, um, but it is a glutaraldehyde solution. Uh, and while it sometimes, uh, like CCHEM, uh, in Flourish XL's description, it says uh, it's an organic source of bioavailable carbon. Uh, so glutaraldehyde is actually uh, a compound that's used as a biocide to cold sterilize medical equipment. Now it does so, uh, the, the compound cross-links proteins causing, you know, uh, both immediate and long-term damage, uh, tissue damage in both plants and animals. Um, so glutaraldehyde solution uh, like Excel, is it diluted? Yes. Does CCHEM try to get around the fact that glutaraldehyde itself is, I believe, banned in in use in aquarium products in most of Europe? Yes. They, they call it various isomers um, to say that it's not glute. Uh, but regardless, whatever ice cream you call it, it's still more or less a glutaraldehyde compound. Um, so CCHEM claims, and they try to show you science, that at the end of the day, glute breaks down and offers a little bit of carbon to your plants. To be honest, uh, glutaraldehyde has a half-life of about 12 hours. So once you dump this in your tank, a, in 12 hours or less, uh, the glute has already done its damage to your plants and fish. Um, all while adding, you know, a negligible, if any, most likely not any, uh, amount of usable carbon or CO2 to your plants. What people see sometimes is like, well, I, I use Excel in my tank and, and it helps. Well, you're putting a biocide in your tank, uh, even if it's considered a mild biocide, just because it's a weak solution. What happens is that glutaraldehyde attacks the algae or it has an effect on the algae first. So it acts as an algicide. Um, so it may kill off the algae in your tank, uh, which theoretically by killing off the algae, it would allow plants, uh, less competition for the nutrients in the water column. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, uh, glutaraldehyde is not selective for algae. Um, uh, it causes tissue damage in plants and animals. Um, so it also damages the tissue in many, in all plants. Um, in most, some plants, it just has more severe effects. These will be species uh, like your Valisneria, um, some of your cryptocorins. So when people talk about uh, their plants melting because they added Excel, that's because the glutaraldehyde is literally just uh, destroying the plant tissue itself. Um, so not a product that I ever suggest, and it definitely does not provide uh, any noticeable or usable source of carbon or CO2. Tony Danford never touched the research CO2 system. That's the point of tonight's stream. It's not to tell you everything you need to know, um, but it is to, to get your interest and hopefully, you know, maybe you you were a little daunt. It, the, the information can seem really complicated and, and it can seem a bit scary at first. Um, hopefully I can kind of show you that it's not so bad after all. As to ask, what makes fish not like CO2? Is it too much and they are being poisoned? Um, it can be, it takes 
pretty high levels of CO2 to actually poison your fish. Um, and, and generally speaking, I think people more so run into a problem. Can you gas your fish with CO2? If you have an efficient diffusion method, whether it's a reactor or whatever, and very low surface agitation, uh, yes, just you can limit the gas exchange so you're not getting oxygen in the tank, uh, which which can cause problems with, uh, you know, fish and, and respiration. Uh, there is a misconception that you don't want surface agitation, you don't want to run sumps, you don't want to run air stones if you have CO2 because then you're off-gassing your CO2. Are you off-gassing some CO2? Yes. Is it a noticeable amount? Not particularly. Don't be afraid to run an air stone to be to run a spray bar near the surface, to run a hang on back filter, um, or to run a sump because you're worried about losing CO2. You're not going to lose enough uh, to have to worry about it. And the increased surface agitation uh, actually keeps your oxygen levels up while being able to maximize your CO2 levels. Uh, and Fish Guy Nick said, too much CO2 means less O2 dissolved in the water being hard for them to breathe. Uh, yep, it, can, it does and it can. Um, so, and we'll talk about that uh, when we talk about tuning CO2 and, and kind of fine tuning things a little bit more. Uh, I said, if you, I feel like if you buy one of these fancy plants, I'm just going to kill it. Uh, most plants can grow without CO2 supplementation. Um, and, and plants, unlike fish, are, are easy to replace most of the time. Deborah Lewis kind of echoed what I was talking about with Excel. She said she had some bowels, which is one of the species I mentioned, um, and it definitely damaged them and took a while to uh, to come back. Uh, so we will press. Uh, so let's talk about your ROI uh, when you purchase a CO2 setup. Again, this is another picture of that tank from the very beginning by Tom Barr. Beautiful tank, excellently escaped, wide variety of species. There's probably 45 species in that tank. Looks great. Tom's good at what he does. If you're ever looking for information on planted tanks, check out uh, the Barr Report. It's all Tom stuff. Super good stuff. Um, so we'll talk about initial costs, long-term costs, and the benefits outweigh the costs which is a matter of opinion, really. Some people have bigger budgets, some people don't. That's okay. Slide. Oops. Uh, so initial costs. Like I said, CO2, um, if you're just going with a, like a DIY setup, you can set up DIY CO2 on a small tank for 20 or 30 bucks. Pretty cheap. Easy way to get into it. Like I said, with DIY, you have smaller initial costs um, but you do have to stay on top of it. The labor is going to be a little more intensive in order to, you know, maintain consistency and optimize the effects of that CO2. Excuse me. A pressurized setup can run you anywhere from, if you look used, you can get quality used equipment. Um, like saltwater guys that run, you know, carbon reactors um, or calcium reactors. Sorry, they'll run CO2 so that a lot of the times when they get out, they'll sell the CO2 setup cheap. I personally paid 100 bucks for my tank uh, and the regular with the solenoid uh, used in 2005. Um, if you look around, you can still find pretty good deals on used stuff. A uh, diffuser, if you're using just a, a ceramic disc diffuser, it's going to run about 10, 15 bucks. An atomizer, we're running a little bit more. Um, and then I personally run, so I run a Rex Grig style reactor, which is basically just a PVC pipe. Uh, costs about 15 bucks and maybe 20 minutes to build. There are powered reactors that can run, you know, up to a hundred bucks. Colin offers a couple different reactors um, that, that he builds himself and, and they're excellent pieces of equipment. Uh, and those run, you know, 50 to a hundred bucks. So if you were to buy a new regulator for a good price, I would, I would spend, you know, there are some cheap options out there. Um, but the longevity is in question. I would spend about $150 on a new uh, regulator, and that'll come with your solenoid, generally come with a bubble counter a tank. You can get get into like an exchange program at your local gas shop or something. Otherwise, the new tanks are only 50 to 75 bucks. Um, 
Uh, so, you know, play them. If you, if you want to pressurize set up, I would say 200 to 250 bucks. If you're, if you're buying stuff new, will will get you going just fine. If, if you're buying fancy equipment, you can get a nice GLA regulator that's all stainless and spend three or 400 bucks on it. Uh, but that's not necessary. There are a couple of people out there building custom regulators that, that do a great job as well. So long-term costs. Uh, so DIY, your long-term cost um, is going to be your time because it's going to be a little bit extra work to make sure you stay on top uh, of your mixtures. Uh, and then you're constantly having to, to buy like a citric acid type formula or, or whatever you're using. Um, so it's smaller cost each time. Uh, but my time's worth something. And so is my effort. And that can be a headache to mix all the time. My pressurized setup long-term, like I said, uh, my, my regulator solenoid, no maintenance problems. And I've been running them every day for 15 years. So no costs uh, for maintenance on that. Um, for the CO2 itself, like I said, I own my tank. So every five years, I pay about 30 bucks for the hydro test. Um, and then it costs me 15 to $20 every four months to fill it. Like I said, that's a 10 pound tank on a 125 gallon aquarium pushing quite a bit of CO2. And I get four to six months out of it. If you run less CO2, obviously that'll last longer. Um, like I said, if you, if you have a 10 gallon aquarium, and a 10 pound CO2 cylinder, you'll probably get a year, year and a half out of it for your, and like I said here, personally, like it, it depends where you go, um, but I spend about 15 or $20 to fill it. Uh, there are some budget options you can use. They do make regulators um, a, and for little paintball tanks, like your 20 ounce uh, paintball tanks that you'd use, obviously you're gonna fill pay <clears throat> six to nine dollars um to fill those little like 20 ounce or whatever they are uh, but you're gonna have to fill them more often so that means more trips to the store um for what you're getting you're paying more i mean most of the cost of a fill is labor co2 itself is fairly cheap usually um so when people ask you know what the long-term costs are you know the, the 30 dollars. so so on my 125 30 dollars every five years and about 20 bucks every four months and, and because of that five to 10 times increase in growth rate, I sell roughly, you know, just, just trimming my plants. So I don't buy farm plants and, and sell them to people. I, I sell trimmings out of my tank. So if you buy something from me or if you get plants from me, that is cut with that day that I ship it out. I, I snip it out of my tank as it grows and ship that to you. Um, you can easily make just doing that with one tank. You can easily make two hundred, three hundred dollars a month, which is paying for your CO two costs. So long term costs. Um, there's potential to to definitely not only cover your costs, but but make a couple bucks back. Um, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Uh, that's a, a matter of opinion. If you're doing DIY, is the extra work worth uh, you know the, the potential improvement that you get? Um, does do you are you able to grow you know? more interesting plants or, or your plants look better by running a pressurized setup, even if you're not selling stuff, um, you know, again, that's up to you. I personally, you know, I'm a plant geek. I think it's worth it. You may or may not think so. <clears throat> Blood, sweat, and tears going to the plants you buy from me. Uh, if, if you watch my last video I posted about maintenance on the 125, you can see there's not a ton of blood, sweat, and tears that go into that tank. Um, it, it's pretty well about on track now. I do need to rescape it, uh, but I spend about 30 minutes uh, a week, you know, doing water change and maintaining that tank. And a lot of people think, well, you know, higher light, higher CO2, more nutrients, you know, means more maintenance. Uh, but my planted tank isn't any, isn't really any more maintenance uh, than any other tank. Like I said, that's a 125, so it's fairly good size. And I did a, a 35 gallon water change, trimmed some plants, added the ferts in about 30 minutes the other day. Uh, closing statements. So we talked about why you'd want to run CO2, what you can accomplish with CO2, what you need to set up CO2, how you get CO2 from the cylinder, or your generator into the tank, how you measure it, how you control it. Um, some other, you know, considerations uh, when, you know, considering running CO2 in the tank. Uh, we had some questions along the way. I've been yakking about it for about an hour now. Uh, but if you guys have any other questions, if you want to get 
down into you know some more details on any specific topic uh the official one hour co2 talk is complete and like i said that's that's kind of a, a broad overview uh that's not so that you can walk away from this being an expert that's you know hey this isn't that bad this isn't as complicated as it seems um if there's anything you want me to go back over let me know and i'll jump back through the slides so you can take a look uh, if you're sick of hearing me ramble about plants we can talk about something else um, so that's that's my little one hour rundown on co2 what you guys got uh, so that was it guys let me know what you think did you enjoy it? Did you not enjoy it? Uh, please leave your feedback in the comments below or again, email me mike.allthingsfish at gmail.com. I'd love to speak with you and see what we can do to, to improve the experience a little bit and make sure um, that you're enjoying both the, uh, the quality and the, and the content itself. Um, but that's all. That's all, like I said, uh, uh, not an in-depth discussion, just a scratch on the surface to hopefully spark your interest and maybe get you interested a little bit more in trying some things out in your planted tank. If you have any questions, as always, feel free to ask. Uh, until next time, this is Mike, all things fish. Have a great night.